Welcome to Illinois Lawmakers' continuing coverage of the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly during the month of May. I'm Jack Kitchener, along with Rich Miller of CapitalFacts.com. Rich, we're two weeks away from the scheduled end of the session on the 31st. A lot of big issues are still hanging fire, and some are wondering if they're going to make it across the finish line. I think most of it probably will. Um, you know, two weeks, you've been around a long time, and you know a lot can happen in two weeks. Uh, for instance, if you take the, uh, the cannabis legalization bill, they've been working on this piece of legislation for two years. And so there are a lot of things that they understand about it that they can pull out and substitute something else for it if that particular one doesn't work. So that's where they're at right now, basically, on a lot of issues. What about the Capitol bill? That's a big lift because it requires, uh, it may require an increase in a motor fuel tax and, you know, gas prices are going up right now. Um, the governor has said that he really doesn't like sales taxes, this, uh, but, you know, you got to pay for capital projects. So, there may so be that's a tough vote. So there may be some other revenue streams that find their way in there that might take some of the sting out of the gas tax hike. And maybe not even this year, but who knows? I mean, really, who knows? Right. What about the graduated income tax? Um, I think the constitutional amendment uh, portion of it will pass. The question becomes now whether the rate bill, the, the, the legislation that sets the rates, uh, will be taken up at another time. Because that's, a, that's, that's really where the rubber meets the road with that one. That's where the actual bracket's set for how much you and I right. all pay. Right. But really, they should just do all this at once. Instead of taking, like, put off a tax increase or what have you for six months or, or nine months, ten months, whatever it is, or a year or more, um, just do it and get it over with and throw it all together in one pile and let everybody figure it out. What about sports betting? That's another one. That's another big one. The governor's kind of counting on that for his budget proposal. Right. That's gotten rolled into a casino gaming expansion uh, bill. And so that becomes so huge, it becomes problematic to pass. Uh, but... The speaker has said he wants, he, he's prepared to support a Chicago casino. He doesn't always say that sort of thing. If they have all four leaders and the governor on board, they can haul it across the finish line. One final question, and that has to do with uh, Leader Durkin was just on the floor saying uh, COGFA, the Office of Management and Budget, are all saying we're going to have a surplus next year. We don't need to raise taxes at all. We're going to have a surplus uh, we got $1.5 billion this year, which took out most of the deficit for this fiscal year. The $800 million that they're projecting for next fiscal year increase is being taken up by an increased pension payment that the governor wanted to skip. So there is no extra money for next year. That, that is just patently false. There is no extra money for next and we've year. We've still got something like 5 to $6 billion in overdue bills from left over from the budget impasse, right? Yeah, uh, as of yesterday, I think it was 4.9. Oh, well, that's, well, that's lower than it was. Yeah, lower than it has been. but it's still high. Uh, with some of these big issues, as you say, that are still hanging fire, there's been some speculation they may go overtime. What do you think about that? Um, they'd be fools to do that. I mean, they had four years where they were, had nonstop sessions and on weeks and months overtime session. Uh, you'll recall they had a, it was July before they finally overrode Rauner on the income tax hike veto. Um, they would just be fools to do that. They've got unified government they need to get done by May 31st. Rich Miller, thanks as always for your insights into all the happenings here under the dome. We appreciate it. Up next on the program, the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services is coming under renewed scrutiny because of recent tragedies. The Illinois Department of Children and Family Services is under increased scrutiny after a pair of reports raised serious uh, concerns about how the agency deals with some of Illinois' most vulnerable uh, residents. Here to discuss the issues facing the agency are State Representative Sarah Feigenholz, a Chicago Democrat who chairs the House Committee on Adoption and Child Welfare. She's joined by Republican Representative Terry Bryant of Murfreesboro, who's a member of the House Human Services Committee. Good to have you both on the program Thank this morning. You. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. You know, the, there have been so 
so many cases over the years that have captured the imagination because of the terrible things that have happened. But right now, uh, uppermost on a lot of people's minds, the case of five-year-old A.J. Freund of Crystal Lake, whose parents are charged in his death. Uh, this has put DCFS back in the spotlight. Uh, because of numerous contacts that the, the family had with the agency and the child had, uh, and we still ended up with this terrible result. Uh, Representative Feigenholz, you've been working on child welfare issues for a number of years here, ever since you got here to Springfield. This isn't the first time the agency's come under this kind of scrutiny. That's right, Jack. Um, but I think that uh, this is that type of an agency that when things go wrong, they go very wrong, and they uh, unfortunately don't end well for children. Um, and people have a tendency to react. It's a very emotional issue, uh, especially this past story with A.J. Freund. Sadly, the Adoption and Child Welfare Committee has been reviewing other death cases that have occurred in the state. And we're really trying to go through the timelines and that we're getting from the department. and. Where, where we see what we perceive as problematic, we then ask questions. And, and I think that you, in the, you know, fast forward to what you heard from the governor yesterday, that he is going to, uh, he, that the department is going through some of these high-risk cases and, and putting crisis management teams together to get to these families after those cases are re-reviewed to prevent what happened to A.J. Freund and some of these other children. So there are some imme immediate action steps that yes. DCFS and the new acting director, Mark Smith, are taking. Yes. Uh, Representative uh, Bryant, you've been watching this situation from the perspective of the Human Services Committee, which oversees a uh, budget and a number of different things for DCFS and other agencies. Yeah, so in addition to uh, A.J.'s case, uh, just about a month ago, or a little bit longer than that, we had a case in Southern Illinois of uh, Byron Casanova, a nine-year-old uh, who uh, repeatedly uh, had uh, outcries from uh, people in the community, uh, as well as a father who was trying to get uh, him removed from a household, and ultimately he was returned to a house to the household and hanged himself. So, um, you know, there, and uh, Representative Severin and I met with some local law enforcement folks, as well as the, some DCFS officials and the investigator to look at how that fell through the cracks. And one of the issues that we found in that case was, uh, although um, uh, law enforcement is uh, a mandatory reporter, yes. it doesn't work in the opposite direction. So DCFS may go into a home and find drug paraphernalia or one of the parents on drugs, and they don't have to report that back to law enforcement. I think that one thing in talking to the two of you in the run-up to, to today's interview is the sheer complexity of the layers of different agencies, law enforcement, mm -hmm. you know, teachers, uh, you name it. Uh, and there, as we, we said at the outset, there are a couple of reports that the bear mentioning. One is by the Auditor General's office uh, that was ordered by the House uh, a while back. The second, of course, is the University of Chicago's Chapin Hall uh, Child Welfare Think Tank. Uh, the Auditor General's report looks at specifically the inspectors and what uh, the, investigators. the investigators who are out mm -hmm. there in the field on this. Right. The Chapin Hall thing looks at a program called Intact Families, correct? Correct. The Chapin Hall report uh, focused on Intact because this is a program where children uh, stay with their family. Uh, and uh, and and they're they're kind of they're they're different, and what we're seeing is is that some of the the, the you know after the investigator determines that this is to be an intact family program, um, the public and everybody needs to know that not very often I mean you know a great percentage of the time they will call a community provider like. Children's Home and Aid or Webster Cantrell or, you know, depending on what region in the state this family lives in, to do the case management. Mm -hmm. And as things erode in, in this, in, you know, and, and we're talking about case, case workers that are underpaid in 85% of this, you know, these, it's called the POS, the Catholic Charities. These have not seen a rate increase for 12 years. 
And so the, there's a lot of turnover, there's no job stability, no case management stability. I mean, there's fractures all throughout the system. And intact families was basically, that was, I, I don't think the word is outsourced, but privatized and was it 2012? Is that pretty much how it works in, in your part well, of I believe Southern we Illinois? Have, we have an intact um, uh, facility or, that where folks work out of a facility in Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do great work there. Uh, the problem is that uh, in some cases, it's the parents that they're trying to fix rather than protecting the children. And this goes way back. Mm -hmm. Forty years ago, um, I was, you know, I lived with my grandparents who were helping my mom raise my sisters and I. My grandparents also kept what were then termed foster children. We had one foster child my grandparents wanted to adopt. They returned him to his father, and, and then ultimately his father beat him so badly that he was beyond recognition. And uh, I think that there is a push too often to return children to a family uh, that they shouldn't go back to. And then there are times when there are families that a child shouldn't have been taken away from, and they do. And I think a lot of that goes to different uh, parts of the agency not communicating well with each other. They just don't, I mean, we know computers don't always talk to each other. Mm -hmm. In this case, we have whole offices and bureaus within an agency that don't talk to each other. And that's one of the things that came up in the Auditor General's report, that the hotline uh, oftentimes goes, un goes unanswered by the sheer volume of calls. And so the uh, folks on the other end have to make calls back and things get dropped. You know, what, in, in one of the hearings, Jack, we asked uh, Royce Kirkpatrick, who's the CFO of DCFS, what the uh, cumulative amount of cost, of cuts this agency has suffered. And it's astronomical, $219 million, beginning with the Blagojevich administration, and they lost their cost of living adjustments. So we, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that what Representative Bryan is talking about is a philosophy, mm -hmm. but I also think that um, before we ch have a knee-jerk reaction about uh, whether we remove or reunify, we have to take the stress off of the frontline workers. Mm -hmm. And we have to give them, so we have to have uh, put more work uh, investigators and case managers in on both sides. We have to change their lens and their training and how they look at this. And we have to restore. Uh, we can't have a knee-jerk reaction to just pull kids out. You know, we have to. If there has to be a place for them to go as how, well. Correct. But and if we are going to keep intact, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have got to thicken, and we have to do wraparound. Uh, and make it a, a much richer service package to avoid those kinds of dangers that Representative Bryant was talking about. One of the step that's, uh, steps that's already underway is Governor Pritzker's proposed budget for uh, fiscal year 2020 uh, adds 126 caseworkers to, to the mix, and uh, they're already on their way toward filling some of those positions. Is that right? Yes. Um, last I asked, um, I think that they were, a couple weeks ago, it was reported that they had already hired 89 workers. I think that they're likely to have to revisit some of this because of the attrition. But I, you know, I, I'm, I know that there's a lot of discussion that we, we can't wait uh, to help them staff up and we can't wait to give them tools. They need them now. You know, Jack, in addition to the line staff mm -hmm. leaving from attrition, we've also had more than 10, more than 18, somewhere, somewhere around 18 uh, directors coming you from just, my... Um, you just... Yeah, uh, I think it was 18. I was just getting ready to ask in, that. In yeah. my previous career uh, in Department of Corrections, I saw um, probably, I think in one year, there were three directors in the Department of Corrections. What happens to the line staff then is they don't know who, whose rules that they're supposed to be following, and so they get to a place where they just say, I'm going to do this the way I know how to do it, and it might not follow the rules that are in place, then they're in trouble then for discipline, and so then they just stop doing things altogether, and that's some of where I think we see yes. kids fall through the cracks. There has to be stability within the agencies. Strong leadership. A focused mission is what this agency has lost with all this director turnover. And so that needs to be restored because morale is very low. 
There's so much to do. Um, we have this. We could make the whole program about sure. this. Or several programs. I well, thank you both for your interest and your hard work on the topic, Representative Sarah Feigenholz, Representative Terry Bryant. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank Up you. next on the program, we're going to dig a little deeper into the situation facing higher education in the state of Illinois. Governor J.B. Pritzker is proposing a 5% increase for the state's public universities and community colleges next fiscal year, but higher education leaders are worried they might actually have to end up taking some cuts if those revenue proposals don't pass here in the spring session. Joining us now to talk about the higher education uh, landscape in the state of Illinois, our Senate Higher Education Committee Chairman, Pat McGuire, he's a Crest Hill Democrat, along with uh, Senator Steve McClure of Springfield, the Republican spokesman on the House of uh, the Senate. Higher Education Committee. Uh, gentlemen, there was kind of a collective sigh of relief back in February when the governor rolled out a new proposal that he wanted to invest more in higher education, a 5% increase. He wanted to spend more on the monetary award program uh, grants. Uh, how was that viewed in, in your Senate Committee on Higher Education, and what was the feedback you were getting from uh, various leaders across the state? I believe there's bilateral support bipartisan support for increasing MAP grants. I've been told by leaders of both public and private institutions of higher education that the single best thing we can do to uh, strengthen Illinois higher ed is uh, provide more MAP grants because this year's appropriation is a record $401 million, but even at that, fewer than half of the students who qualify for MAP grants get MAP grants. And, and, and your side of the aisle as well? Yeah, I think everybody's supportive of higher education funding, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, and that's, it's one of the few bipartisan issues where we've got such a good working relationship with the Democrats on that. And so all of us want to fund higher education as much as we can. The question always comes down to the revenue sources. And, and that's exactly right. And, and this year, of course, we're looking at uh, the possibility of taxing recreational marijuana if that passes here in the House and Senate. We're also looking at the possibility of expanded gaming. There's uh, proposals for sports gaming. There are mm -hmm. You know, tied in with that, there's all the casino gaming and uh, you, you name it as far as that that goes. So, uh, but th those those revenue sources haven't passed yet, and there's a lot of controversy, particularly with recreational marijuana. So, we may not have that at our disposal. Right, but before we even get to that, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we're spending the revenue that we have wisely, and we're mindful of the enrollment declines at some of our regional public universities. And we're working to reverse those employment, those enrollment declines. Um, but if a school has lost 20% of its enrollment, and it's still on what's called the ramp list, not the pension ramp list, but right. capital RAMP, resource allocation and management program for capital projects, I heard, I think it was Governor State University uh, President Elaine Mayman say in committee the other day that the Deputy Governor for Education, Jesse Ruiz, has asked schools to submit amended capital projects wish list and that makes a lot of sense to me because the current ramp list is 15 years old and given all the changes in higher ed since then mm -hmm. from enrollment declines to the growth in online education I'm not prepared to fund capital requests that were made 15 years ago before all these changes in higher ed have occurred so I think we need to take a tough look at that and from your perspective um that uh, a lot of those uh, ramp projects are at, if you will, downstate universities where the bulk of the uh, uh, state's higher education infrastructure is located. Would you agree that it's uh, probably a good idea to take a look at that and kind of fine tune that to where uh, the enrollment is at those places? Yeah, we have to look at that. We're in a desperate situation financially and, and everybody knows that. And so we have to act as though that's the case. Uh, you headed a higher education working group uh, yes. with uh, that also had House participation. It was yes. Democratic and and uh, and uh, uh, Republican. Uh, a lot of the things that uh, I understood that you looked at the last time I talked to members of that working mm -hmm. committee was uh, how the state distribute, distributes that overall uh, funding uh, formula right. for the universities around the state. And just as you talked about the idea with uh, capital projects, mm -hmm. how, how are you looking at uh, how the state apportions those, those funds in view of the enrollment situation around the state? I appreciate you mentioning the Higher Ed Working Group. It's the best thing I've done in my seven years down here. So it's a 12-member 
bipartisan, bicameral group, six Dems, six Republicans, six House members, uh, six Senate members. And honestly, if you were to observe our meeting, you'd think you were in Nebraska, where there are no party affiliations for legislators. We get along that well. I was so pleased with our work last spring that I had a team picture taken. Um, so to answer your question, um, one half of 1% of our appropriation to universities is performance funding. Mm -hmm. the, nine, the remaining 99.5% could best be described as historical. What did we give you last year? Well, there's no rigor in that. So we started gathering information on uh, base funding formula, and we got information from IBHE, we got information from other states. Um, it's a lot to go through, and we're still digesting what we've received. So are you looking at the possibility of maybe uh, digging into that at a lot, lot deeper level and putting those figures together in terms of um, uh, enrollments, uh, the different kind of programs each of those universities delivers? Yes, well? and, and, and our interest in um, a base funding formula is in large part inspired by the evidence-based funding um, K through 12 bill that we passed a year or so ago. So if, if identifying 20 some effective practices is an effective way to ensure a quality education for every um, student in our public schools, K through 12, maybe that, maybe that same logic should be applied to higher ed. And I think there needs to be stability too. And I think that would give the stability these schools need because a lot of these, you know, I, I constantly hear from my public colleges and universities and they talk about the fact that we never quite know how much money we're going to be getting. If we can get them in a place where they know essentially or have a good idea of what they're going to be getting, that's going to be helpful to everyone. It's going to of course be helpful to us to determine how much money we're going to need to reserve for uh, higher education funding. And of course all of this comes on, on the heels of uh what was one of the strangest things I've ever seen around here was a two and a half year budget impasse mm -hmm. where state universities basically weren't part of the funding stream for the right. most part and they only ended right. up with what, about 30% of what they right. normally would over a two right. year period? Right, of course during that shameful 736 day bu budget impasse the sectors of state government the sectors of Illinois life that were hurt the most were human services and higher education. And I was painfully aware of that, but I never knew how they intersected, to use the contemporary lingo, until students from Northeastern Illinois University visited me here in the Capitol, and they were majoring in social work. And a graduation requirement is to complete an internship. They couldn't complete their internships because they got laid off by the human service agencies yeah. at which they were working. And we came very close to losing Chicago State University because they were within days of not having any operating funds during that whole mess. Right, and they were put on probation by the Higher Learning Commission. And Steve, I don't know if you were here, but in April of 2017, I think, we got a letter from the director of the Higher Learning Commission. Every member yes. did. Yes. And it warned of accreditation consequences. You could feel this building shake. I think that's one reason we ended the impasse. There's, there's also uh, a, an historical uh, walk back that you need to think about too, because the state has been spending less overall for higher education right. going back to, I think the, 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 the high point was like 2002 when it was $2.4 mm -hmm. billion, mm -hmm. something like that. And we've never been quite able to, to catch up with that. And then of course the budget impasse hits. And I think there's been less of an emphasis on higher education. There's never been the connection made, at least on a statewide level, that says, listen, most people remain in the state where they go to college. And therefore, there's, a, there's an economic incentive for the future to keep people here and to bring people here. If we've got great colleges and universities, people want to come here to go to these great programs, et cetera. To me, there's a real economic aspect to this that doesn't get touched on enough. Well, and I think the figure that I heard last year was we lost something like 50,000 students in a period from uh, about a decade to other right. states, and we continue to lose students to other states where tuition's lower. Maybe they've got a better financial aid package than we do, and that goes back to your earlier point, Senator, about uh, that, those MAP grants and the RISE scholarships and the like. Right, and years ago, Illinois adopted what's called a, uh, a high-cost, high-aid model. And when I first learned of this, I thought, who would ever go for that? But it seemed to have been a genuine paradigm shift, and it was a book published by two academics that argued that uh, robust state appropriations to public universities, uh, which thus kept tuition down, were an unnecessary subsidy to the middle class. And so apparently, the, under this design, tuition would rise as indicated by the market, and that would be balanced by increased financial aid. But I think what happened in Illinois 
is the cost of tuition and fees became stratospheric and we have not been able to keep up with financial aid. And that's why you see neighboring states like Missouri, Indiana, and the like basically poaching Illinois college students. And Iowa too, and you know, Iowa has a few public universities, we have quite a few. And I think some of the most recent proposals that we've heard, we had a bill, a couple of interesting bills. One of the bills for the common application for Illinois higher education institutions. And therefore, you, you fill out this application, it goes to, you know, ISU, U of I, all these, and you find out which ones you get into, what your uh, scholarship would be. I think that would be helpful to keep kids here. And I think there's another bill that we just dealt with in committee last, or earlier this week, um, from Senator Collins, which addresses mm -hmm. that if you meet these criteria, you're gonna get into a few of our public universities automatically. So it eliminates the questions that a student might have. Well, am I gonna get in? Is this gonna waste my time? And so these are, these are things that are all helpful. Lots of work still to be done. We're going to have to end on the note. But thanks very much for your insights into this very important topic for all of the state of Illinois. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, Thank Senator you. McGuire, Senator uh, McClure, thanks so much. That's it for this uh, week's edition of Illinois Lawmakers. We'll be back next time, next week, same time, same station.